Hello and welcome back to another episode of my Household Robot Project. I'm Joe. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. And if you've come back, well, here we go again. Now we left off with me finally succeeding in getting the point cloud data back from the robot. Now I needed to do something with it. Now to take that point cloud and turn it into a usable map, I needed to know the position and direction of the robot. I wondered if I could use the point cloud data and track it from frame to frame to yield that result. Basically what I did was I would take the point cloud data and store it in a map, a two-dimensional map. Well, sort of three-dimensional? Uh, I like to call it a two-dimensional volumetric map if you... yeah. It would then compare the two maps at various angles to each other, and if it aligned well enough, it would decide that that is the direction it's facing. I put together the code, and it actually worked pretty good for how bad it worked. And what I mean by that is, it actually tracked the direction of the head pretty well. But it was slow, and also the point cloud that it yielded was just absolutely ugly. It was full of all sorts of nonsense. You see, I needed to clean up that time of flight camera image so that it would have very true distance readings, but I didn't need as many pixels as it offered. So what I did is I took it and broke it up into 4x4 four four pixel blocks, so 16 pixels each. And it would average out all of the distances for all those pixels in that block. And that would give me a good, stable distance reading. But then I was getting these, well, what I call ghost points in my point cloud. They were points hanging in the middle of space where nothing should be, and I needed to figure out what those were. And then I did. It turns out... That was when one of the 4x4 four four pixel blocks was overlapping an edge where half of the pixels were on one surface and half of the pixels were on another surface much further away. It would end up putting a point in space to represent that sector that was just hanging in the middle of emptiness. So the solution I came up with was to simply track the contrast in each one of those blocks. If the 4x4x4 four pixel, four pixel block had too much distance separation between the different pixels in it, it would simply throw it out. I had enough points in the point cloud. And that worked. But the movement tracking code in the head didn't work as well, probably because it didn't have as many points to reference against. But the point cloud map that it yielded was much more useful. Besides that, my system of tracking the difference in the point cloud from one frame to another was just simply too slow. I have lots of processing power that I need to save for other things. It took about a tenth of a second to process every frame. And that didn't even include linear movement. That was just the rotation of the camera itself. So I decided I needed odometry. Basically measuring the distance that each wheel moves against the ground. That will give the robot a reasonable impression of how far it's moved between frames and how much it's turned. For this, I had acquired a while back some magnetic encoders, or uh, according to their data sheet, they're called magnetic potentiometers. And basically, they're a non-contact magnometer chip that measures the position of a magnet that's close by. And as you rotate the magnet, it will yield a different number that it returns to you. I was very excited to try these out, but I had trouble getting a clean output. The output seemed unstable, and I had to have the magnet very, very close to the chip to make it work at all. After a little bit of troubleshooting, I discovered it was the pins. These pins here, I don't know how well you can see that. They are steel. And when I, I was welding in steel pins into a little breakout board right next to this magnometer, while well, the pins were messing up the magnetic field flux lines, so I was getting horrible, dirty readings. I got rid of the pins and just soldered copper wire to the board and kept everything steel away from it, and it worked really well. So side note, if you ever experiment with those and find out you get horrible results, uh, try making sure you don't have magnetic steel pins in the board right next to the chip. Lesson learned. Now, these chips use I squared C for communication, which is a uh, digital bus communication protocol really quite nice to work with when you're using Arduinos. But one problem is that every single chip has to have its own address. That is how each chip knows if it's being spoken to on the bus. Now, I need two of these encoders, one for each wheel. 
And, well, the problem there is that they use the same address. Well, how do I find my way around this one? For the motor cortex of the robot, I'm using a TNC 4.1, which is a very powerful Arduino style microprocessor. And it has three I squared C ports. The problem is that the library that is written for these chips is only written for one I squared C port. So I can't just put one on one port and one on another port. I'd have to modify something. I found online that you can modify the library itself to use a different port, and that works. But I'm more of a hardware guy. So I made a chip select unit. I just used a pair of diodes and a pair of resistors, and what it will do is it takes the clock to the on the I squared C bus and shorts it high to the chip that it's not reading right now. That just makes that chip dormant. It's perfect. After that, all I had to do is model up and print out the holders for these sensors. Well, when I say print out, I didn't have to print them out. My brother printed them out for me. See, what's better than having a 3D printer is having a brother with a 3D printer that you can just email him stuff and he prints it out. That's the way to go. Highly recommended. And then I mounted them up. Of course, the cat wanted in on the project as well. And then I modified the Arduino code for that particular processor so that it would actually read the odometers and track how far you've gone. Now, I took a page out of the book of whoever came up with the old optical mouse sensors and made it so that whenever I query the distance traveled, it returns that distance and then clears the odometer. So that every time you read it, it just tells you how far you've gone since you read it last. And that way, I can sample it at any time, and the timing isn't critical to keep track of how far I've actually moved. And now it's time to get the robot actually ready for moving around. Now that means getting the power wiring squared away. Right now, it's powered off of a large variety of cables and wires that attach to it, and I need to make it so that it all runs off the battery in the base. I acquired this 5 volt regulator. It's rated at 10 amp output, which is great. And so I hooked it up to my little oscilloscope and tested the output for how clean it is. And it was very clean. Then I attached it to the servos to see how much it responds to the current they draw when they move. And uh, yeah, I got a really steady signal out of it. So we're off to the races there. And that just leaves me to clean up the wiring. And well, that brings us to where we are now. Next week, I plan to have this thing actually moving around and mapping the area that it's in. So please subscribe to follow along. Um, give this video a like. Helps me out. That's also what I'm supposed to say, right? Because, you know, YouTube, like and subscribe. And I'm really enjoying being able to share my project with other people. I've done my electronics projects alone through my life, and uh, this is much more fun. And now, instead of giving you any closure at the end of this, I'm going to leave you with a video clip of me disassembling the robot again so I can put some power wires into the head. See you next time.